spaces and places in fashion here at FIT. Um, for those of you who are students, this is your second to last lecture. Next week is our final lecture with the Fashion Service Network. And for those of you who are already thinking a little bit about ahead, your test will be available next Tuesday. So don't worry about that yet. It will uh, come next Tuesday. So I'm um, very excited about today because it's a little unique as we talked about last week and that we um, have two guests today. Um, and we are also uh, doing this under the auspices of Transition of Style, a podcast that really explores uh, style journeys and how uh, gender, sexuality, fashion, clothing all intersect. And the host of that show is Corinne Phillips. And Corinne has uh, been doing this podcast for just under a year now, right? And uh, already many episodes uh, that are coming out. So if you haven't taken a listen, you should. It's a, a podcast that explores the ways in which personal style and queer identity meet. <coughs> it's hosted each week, typically in a studio, not live like we are today. Um, and it's a very personal, informative uh, interview uh, between Corinne and her uh, host. Corinne herself, uh, has worked in many different uh, lines of work in her life. I love, she's, she's quite the um, master of all trades. Um, she worked uh, for many years in the music industry, working with people like Maria, uh, Mariah Carey, Kings of Leon, and Damien Rice. She then moved on to become a software developer and worked for companies like Boston Consulting Group. And uh, you didn't want me to say that, did you? She's very talented. And in addition to that, she's now uh, the Chief uh, Technology Officer of QueerCut. Today we also have a wonderful um, uh, guest with us to be part of the podcast, Elliot Sailors. And many of you probably recognize her uh, from fashion magazines and billboards. She got her start um, first shooting with Bruce Weber. Um, and then went on to work with such greats as Peter Beard, Ellen Von Unworth. She's been uh, featured in Times Square on many billboards and um, in, in one case for H&M. Um, she also, you may remember, cut her hair and started uh, modeling menswear, which uh, became quite uh, a conversation in the media. So she appeared on The View, Access Hollywood, CNN, BBC, just to, to mention some. She's been on the runways for brands such as Chromat, Diesel, Rick Owens, Vivian Westwood, menswear. Um, she's been in Vogue, Elle, and as I said, in billboards, um, including the Millie campaign, um, Equality for All. She joined the Beauty for Freedom movement in becoming an ambassador for human rights and fighting human trafficking on a global scale. She's worked with photographer Alexei Lubomirsky in supporting concern worldwide through sales of diverse beauty to celebrate beauty and fashion with no boundaries or limitations and to put every type of beauty out on a pedestal. She's also participated in the All Women Project, representing those who identify as any version of a woman at any time in their lives. So I wanna welcome Corinne and Elliot to FIT. Thank you so much for coming. Patty. Hello. Hello. Can everyone hear me? I can certainly hear myself. All right. How's everyone doing? Oh, wake up, guys. Wake up. Maybe just needs a coffee. Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to thank Josh. Um, thank you so much for having me here, Faces and Places FIT. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, Elliot, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. So great to have you here. Um, as Josh mentioned before, Transition of Style is a podcast where we explore the ways in which personal style and, and gender identity sort of intersect. And I have been um, trying to bring these stories of LGBTQ people, queer people, to the forefront because I really want people to understand the importance of living authentically, right? Living within your authentic right. And so these stories are important because I want people who are struggling with identity and struggling with their sexuality to, to know that it's okay to do that. And I want them to see that displayed in some of the stories we're telling on Transition of Style. So I definitely am so thrilled to have you here because your story is freaking amazing, as we know, right? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> No pressure, no pressure. And very public. <laughs> right, right. It is very public. So you know what? Let's start off with a basic question. Can you talk to me about how you got into modeling? How did it start? Uh, well, I first, first started modeling when I was nine. And my dad took me to some model scout thing. <laughs> um, he tells the story that it was because I wanted to be a model. But <laughs> I'm pretty sure I didn't even know what that was at the time. 
Um, I was not under any pressure from my parents to do it at all. It was definitely, I mean, they introduced me to it. But then once I started, it was only when I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually I moved to New York when I was 19. And that was in 2001. And that's when I started modeling full time. And yeah. So, you know, um, one of the things that, I mean, obviously everyone knows uh, about you, but cutting the hair, and that's been a thing, but I'm curious about how you navigate your identity in, within the fashion world, within, you know, as a model. How do you navigate it? Like, how do you um, sort of, how does, how does your identity play out in that way? Like, how do you, you know what I mean? Like, how yeah, do um, so I do actually identify as gender fluid. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that at the time when I cut my hair, because um, I didn't know the language yeah. and I also have been very blessed and led a really privileged life in the sense that there was never anyone trying to stop me from wanting to live the way that that I had um, my dad is someone who tap dances and cries at commercials and my mom I think is worn makeup like five times ever <laughs> um, and so I didn't have traditional gender roles, right. I guess. Um, not just for those reasons. There's lots of other things that people tend to put on what is masculine or feminine or male or female that uh, were not examples that, that I was taught. Um, and so I was really lucky. And it is accurate that coming up in modeling, there was very much like a, you have to ask permission if you wanna highlight your hair a little bit differently or if you wanna cut bangs or you want to add some more layers, or anything. Yeah. You know, you did need to get permission. So in that sense, there was, but it, I wasn't thinking of it being based around gender. And then when I turned 30, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna keep doing this, I wanna do this my way, and I want it to be fun and exciting and new and different for me. And it was at the time that um, Andrea Pejic had not yet come out as transgender. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't uh, public that uh, she identified as female. So at that time, um, I was inspired by the fact that they were calling themselves an androgynous model. And I was like, well, if they can do that, I can do that too. Um, and tried doing that with my long blonde hair. People were not really having it. <laughs> um, they just didn't believe it. And so I cut my hair because I wanted to work in menswear. And when I first walked into my agency, literally my agency was like, hi, can we help you? Uh, wow, really? <laughs> yeah, is that so weird? Um, even though I'd been there for like eight years. Um, and I told them I wanted the men's board. They were totally supportive. I went onto the men's board and then um, I, I started working in men's and then it was about a year later that it hit the media. So oh, it was a full year? Passed? Yeah. And once it hit the media is when actually I stopped working as much because at that time, Orange is the New Black was not out yet. Caitlyn um, Jenner was not out yet the conversations that are so common now were not happening at that time. And- What year was this? Uh, 2013. Mm. So at that time it was really crazy, you know, this woman is cutting her hair to work in menswear. And, um, and I was saying to be a male model. And since then I say to work in menswear because I don't, I'm not trying to be male and the way that it was taken at that time by a lot of people was that I was co-opting a trans narrative, that I was trying to tell somebody else a story that was not my own. Um, and I hadn't really thought about gender as much as I do now. Um, I had always referred to girls as they, although I didn't, like, meaning they meaning like I didn't feel like I was one, um, but I also referred to guys that way too. I, I just, I don't know, I was happy feeling different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of us are that way. Yeah. Um, and then when I was attacked by a lot of people for the language that I was using, what I chose to do was to really educate myself on it. Why are people getting upset about the way that I'm saying things? Yeah. So rather than defending my position, it was what can I do that's gonna have it work better for other people and so that I can understand why that would be offensive. And not I'm just gonna do what anybody tells me to do, yeah. but I wanna, I wanna get it. And so through that process, I was like, oh, I actually identify as gender fluid. Mm -hmm. 
in my personal case, it's not important to me that people refer to me as they, them, although I have come to discover that's more of how I experience myself. Yes. Um, and so when people ask me, I do let people know that. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm not asked, it's not something that, that bothers me. Right. Um, I have been on castings for menswear where I've walked in and they'll say, you know, okay, everybody line up and take off your shirts. And... <laughs> And I'll be like, that's not going to look how you think it will. <laughs> um, and when I did the Vivian Westwood menswear show, I literally, I go to the casting, I go to the fitting, and then it's like right before the show, and I was opening the show. And I went up to Vivian before we were going on, and I was like, thank you so much for, you know, giving me this opportunity. I was wondering if I could get a selfie with you. And she goes, you're a girl. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, well, that's pretty cool that that all just happened without her even knowing that. Um, so in some ways, I don't, I don't navigate it. I don't give direction to it yeah. um, until there's a moment where someone either is surprised or is about to be surprised. Um, you know, there's a men's show that I did book in London off of, off of my card and what it looked like, and then they found out I was female, and they said, never mind. Um, and, and before when I was saying how once it hit the media that the work actually stopped, it didn't stop altogether, obviously, but it, it slowed down because then it was a public conversation. Then it was Elliot Saylor's, the female trying to look like a guy. So then if you use me in your advertising, you're saying that you agree with that. And it wasn't cool at that time to agree with that. Right. It wasn't, you know, now it's super trendy and I think a lot of brands are doing it even if they aren't necessarily, um, trying to actually make a difference. Yeah. Um, but as it's becoming cool, I also don't think it's this horrible thing that it's cool or trendy either because it is how a lot of people are getting educated. Right, right. Well, you know, so on, along those lines, you talk about, um, it, ha it is changing, right? It, it is changing. Oh, for sure. you do, yeah. We're seeing definitely a change in it. Um, do you feel, what do you think, I, first of all, I think that change is good, and I think we agree that, that that change is good. What do you think needs to happen for it to change more? And and change by change, I mean, I think it's good that we see all sorts of people um, represented on the runway, in print, in campaigns. You know, all sorts of identities. You know, so we're, we're getting a little more of that. What do you think that needs to happen for us to get even more of it? I think that we as consumers need to. Um, <laughs> as awful as this sounds, but when we share it on our Facebook, when we like it on Instagram, when we comment and say that we love it, then brands get that we are behind it. Because there's a whole lot of people out there commenting and saying horrible things about it. Right. And if there aren't as many people showing up in appreciation for what brands are doing and speaking out and saying that they want more of it, then they're not going to bother because whoever is showing up the most in response to what we're seeing is who ultimately they're going to cater to because they believe that that's where their money is is going to come in from. Yeah, I don't I don't think people realize that they have that power. You know, I don't think people realize they have the power to do that. And that's fascinating that you're saying that because I think the average person doesn't realize they have the power to change it like that. Yeah, and it's and not that Brands don't have their own creativity in their own minds and, and you know, things that they're doing on their own, obviously. Um, but, you know, when Alessandra Michele started at Gucci and completely recreated the way that that brand was existing in the world, um, a lot of people got really excited about it and really, you know, fell in love with the work that he was doing and the amazing fluidity of the fashion that exists within Gucci now. And it's because a lot of people got really vocal about loving it, you know, and yeah. that it got to stay. Because I assure you, if that many people were like, I hate it and that's out of control and you're not supposed to do that because Gucci's always been another way, right. it, it wouldn't have kept happening. Yeah. Do you think that there's a fear also internally? Because a lot of people in the fashion industry are, are queer identified anyway. <clears throat> um, photographers, stylists, hair, makeup. Do you think that there's still a sort of a fear to sort of let that, open that up in terms of photo shoots and ad campaigns that there's still a concern about your job or where the money's coming from or what people might think? About being open about your queerness? 
Yeah, or just in turn, because you mentioned, you know, um, that you uh, gave your book, you got the job, and then when they realized you were a woman, they said no. And there, it, it I seems don't think like that would might... happen now. No? No. Um, it's, well, that brand specifically, actually, it might. It's a, it's a men's suiting brand in London that has been a men's suiting brand since, like, the 1600s or something. <laughs> um, so... That might still happen with them. It's been around for a minute. Um, <laughs> but it also might not. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and they certainly couldn't get away with outright saying, oh, it's a woman, never mind. Right. right. Um, and I mean, overall, the fashion industry has always been super queer. Um, it is very different. Um, for a longer amount of time for trans women and for um, feminine identifying men uh, because there is a pressure on a lot of male models that you need to show up and, and be really bro-ish and you know, talk this way. And um, you know, if a guy wants to wear a dress, then that's gonna change the way that you're able to move forward in your career, but that's changing in a lot of ways, and now it's turned into the kind of thing where if a guy wears a dress or a trans woman wears a dress, women are still going to wear that dress. They're not going to be like, oh, I don't know, you know, uh, you know, someone who doesn't identify as a cisgender female wore it, that's uncomfortable, whereas when a girl wears a suit, men are like, nah, girl had that on, I'm not wearing it, um, which is really improving. But it's interesting how now it's actually become harder for masculine men than it is for masculine women than it is for feminine men now in the industry. Wow, I wonder why that is. Like, why it's, why is that? Do you think? Well, uh, like I was saying, I mean, the average male consumer isn't going to want to wear something that some chick just femmed up. You know, the the way that, the way that it's seen. And so, yeah. literally, if their sales go down, they're not going to want to do it again. Even if, um, I mean, if it doesn't affect their sales yeah. and it's improving, or if like more masculine women go out and they're purchasing from that brand, yeah. then it's, or at least if there's a media re positive media response, yeah. you know, all of that's going to help. And that's what I mean by it's on us, yeah. Yeah. you know, because all of those other people are definitely going to say stuff or not show up. Yeah, interesting. Very interesting. So um, one question about, um, doing campaigns or doing, um, you know, doing campaigns is for men's wear as opposed to women's wear. Did you feel like you got treated differently when you were doing men's wear campaigns as opposed to doing women's campaigns? It's so much easier working in men's wear. Really? It's so much easier. Um, everybody's, for the most part, is really chill. Yeah. Um, it's, there's not all this, like, crazy pressure around, um, Okay, this is not true. I was gonna say, there's not all this crazy pressure around weight. There is, it's just different. Yeah. Um, you're not put in things that are as body conscious, yeah. but then, of course, I'm also not wearing the topless, like, I'm not wearing, like, men's swimwear. Because yeah. um, actually, there is as much body pressure for the men. It's yeah. just different in the areas that I'm working in. Right. Um, but in women's wear, there's way more pressure about everything everything. Yeah. Um, they're a lot harder on female models uh, than they are on men when you're actually on the set. Yeah. Um, in terms of how female models treat each other, there's, it's way better than it used to be, uh, but there's still a lot of competitiveness and a lot of um, people kind of keeping themselves. will sit right next to each other on their phones the whole time and you never even say hi to the person next to you. Whereas you go to a male model casting and like everybody's going for pizza after. <laughs> You know, um, it's, yeah, it's just super different. Interesting, interesting. So um, I have a question about like the way you sort of like, um, in your personal life, um, I'm, I'm thinking about the sort of the analogy of like, you know, somebody who is maybe a chef and cooks all day long and, and you know, is in the kitchen all day long cooking, when they go home, they're like, I'm gonna open a canned soup. <laughs> That's it, I'm done. Cheetos and onion dip. That's what I'm doing, right? Because they're just like, I'm not cooking anymore. What do you, like, at home, when you're in your personal life, what do you think about dressing? Do you, are you just like, nope, I'm going to put those PJs on? <laughs> Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. yes. It's just like, I'm, I'm all not. about that pajama life. She wears life. Cheetos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're all about the pajama life? Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, literally, I live in an apartment where the radiator's on or the radiator's off. Like, I don't have control, you know? So it gets real toasty in there. And honestly, it's been like t-shirt and underwear lately. The entire time. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, that's awesome. I, get, I, I totally understand that. Um, all right, so another question for you. Um, when you're doing sort of a campaign or you're, you're modeling, um, I'm wondering, um, in terms of your identity, do you feel like there are things sometimes that, or campaigns that you'll take part in where you're like, I don't see any of my identity in this, but you know, as a model, I'm malleable and I can you know, sort of morph into something if I have to. Or is it that everything you do, there's some piece of your identity that you can find and draw from? Definitely not everything. Right. There are some things that I wear where I'm like, <laughs> why was this even made? I don't understand. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, but definitely like a lot of stuff that, that I really love. And there are a lot of people who, um, like I posted a photo on my Instagram the other day where I'm wearing a dress. And in the caption talked about, identifying as gender fluid and so that really being inclusive of all kinds of things and I brought that up intentionally wearing a dress because a lot most of the people who follow me um, I would say are lesbians and most of those people are masculine of center mm -hmm. and most of them there's this understanding of gender fluidity or um, gender nonconformity that is if you are identified as female at birth if you say you're gender fluid then you need to look male which I find so bizarre it is bizarre. Because um, fluid. <laughs> like. <laughs> if you know what that means. Um, Define fluid, right? Which is also really different for different people. You know, it's not like I'm like, oh, this is the definition either. But um, it's, for me, it flows. Like yes. between what uh, people call masculine and feminine. But also a lot of it, like, I don't even call it that. Right. You know? Right. I mean, because if y'all are in school about this stuff. <laughs> so you know that when you look through history, it's not what a lot of people think, right. you know, right. that right. it's, I mean. I think that's the dress right there, isn't it? Oh, yes yeah, it is. Yeah, and so, you know, this girl was like, I don't understand why you're saying that you're gender fluid if, cause that looks like a feminine dress to me and I wouldn't wear it. And my first response was, and she's like, and I wouldn't feel comfortable wearing it. And I wrote back, well then don't wear it. <laughs> and then I was like, and, <laughs> and like run something nicer after. Uh, but, but, but that's also my point, is that it's like, it's also okay if you identify as gender fluid and you don't feel comfortable wearing that. Well then don't wear it. But right. also, you know, don't be cutting people down because it doesn't fit your thing. Like that's just crazy talk. It is crazy talk. It it's. Is. I mean, for Pete's sake, I walked out the door today wearing black and brown and navy and gold and silver and burgundy <laughs> and green. You like, talked about wearing all the colors. Today. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, and there's plenty of people, I'm sure, who wouldn't have nice things to say about that, but <laughs> I like it and I feel good, so, good for you. you know. Good for you. I, th I see, I think it's really important. I think one of the things we try to talk about in the podcast a lot is that um, the importance of not narrowing people down. Like, I talk about that a lot. Um, I went to a school recently to speak to some students about identity and about, like, their sexuality and trying to make sure they understand that if you wake up one day and you decide you're wearing a tutu today and then the next day you decide you want to wear a tux, a men's tux, you can do that. Yeah. You can do that. You can change it up every single day. Yep. And it's totally fine. You can even change it up on the same day. On the same day. I okay. love it. That's right. Tutu for <laughs> breakfast, tuxedo for dinner, right? Like, literally the same day. Yep. Yeah, I love that. I, love I that. want to piggyback on what you asked, though, because in a, in a way, as a model, it's fairly performative in terms of, like, what you're wearing. It's, you know, you're an actress or an actor or an, yeah. or an act. Um, so, you know, you are sort of putting on a show or you're, you're looking a certain way. Um, but I think in many ways, that's sort of what we do every day as well. I mean, when we walk out the door, we sort of perform a certain way that we want people to see us. And I'm just curious, especially since you're a model, if, if there is sort of a difference between, you know, going out for your personal, you know, in your personal style versus sort of the performance that you have to do as a model. Um, I find it interesting too, because you're like, because the way we want people to see us, for me a lot of the time I'm kind of like not interested in being seen today. Mm -hmm. It's more like that yeah. uh, sometimes. Yeah. And it's, 
I will literally go to my coffee shop sometimes wearing like the same sweatshirt like five days in a row. Um, and then if I, I live up in Harlem. So then if I, if I'm going somewhere where I actually need to get on the train to get somewhere, then I'll be like, okay, I think I'll wear something different because downtown I might run into some other people that I may have run into the other day or I might not. Um, and still wear that same thing anyway. Um, so does it look different? I mean, sure, it looks different because I don't have somebody dressing me and providing my styling for that day, um, which would be awesome. <laughs> but uh, it looks—it really looks different all the time. Um, I, but for me, when it's It's pretty rare that I'm gonna like wanna put on like a dress and heels in what people would call traditionally feminine, um, unless it's, unless I'm feeling like Alyssa Edwards. You know what I mean? Like, like unless I'm like, all right, today I'm ready to be seen. Mm. You know? Not because I'm like, I wanna blend in with the female population. You know, it's, it's, like a show if I'm doing that for me as opposed to because I'm female and women wear this right. um, and at the same time if I'm wearing a suit I know that I'm probably going to get more attention in a lot of ways wearing that because people are still going to have judgments about that a lot of the time or they might even have positive things to say but still it's going to be there's going to be a lot of people be like oh I like that you're wearing a suit you know, so it's like, it's just knowing that when I'm doing something that doesn't look traditional, there's going to be a lot of people that have something to say about it. Also, one time I was walking on the train platform wearing a dress, and this one was like, <clears throat> boys in dresses. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm, you never know. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I am so sorry you didn't get that Instagram story. That is fantastic. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> wow. Okay. She was really feeling salty about it. She was like 125th it. Street. She's just like. <laughs> feeling salty about it. Boys and dresses. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay. I love that. So listen, I want to say, um, I really love that um, how, you know, when you got the sort of the blowback from, you know, um, cutting your hair and, and people thinking that you were basically trying to tell the story that you felt like wasn't yours, I, I want to like commend you and instead of like being like you know screw you guys I'm just gonna do this trying to understand why that reaction happened right and trying to say okay what's what is it that I need to figure out or learn about the situation instead of just kind of blowing past it you kind of stop for a moment and you you sort of let yourself get educated by it and and at the end of the day I think that regardless of what they were saying, it, like your intention wasn't to, to tell a story that wasn't yours, right? No, not at all. It was never that. And it was also, I mean, when I was telling stories like, you know, people would say, has anything negative happened to you? And I was uh, married to my ex-husband at the time. And there were multiple occasions when people thought that we were a gay male couple and they were really rude to us about that. Like in the West Village, Wow. And places where, like, you just don't think that's going to happen. And that was crazy to me. And so I'd be in an interview, and I'd be like, that's crazy to me. And people would be like, I can't believe you're trying to get pity. You know? And so stuff like that, where it was, like, not, that was not my intention. My point was that it's crazy that that's still happening in the world. Yeah. Not, it's crazy that it happened to me. Because, I mean, I'm really lucky. All of this that, uh, that I've been experiencing in, in terms of uh, gender nonconformity has happened in my 30s. Right. Like, I'm an adult. Like, I can handle it. I'm fine. Um, but that's because I got to live this really blessed, privileged life all the way up until then where everything, you know, was pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And I say pretty easy, and I'm, and I'm going to be honest about this, that there's also plenty of times where looking like the 5'10", blonde-haired, blue-eyed model, people treat you really, really badly because they think that you're really stupid or that you're a slut or a whore or they're asking for it or whatever just because you happen to look that way too. So it's not like that's always pleasant. Right. Um, but overall, it is accurate that my life is a lot easier because of the way that I, that I have looked. Right. And so when I looked a totally different way that had it not be as easy, it, I, I was lucky enough to really be able to see that difference in a way that a lot of people don't have it one way and then another way. That's right. Yeah. Um, and 
so then I, you know, I made a point when, you know, when I saw people get upset thinking that I was seeking pity, then I could say, no, my point is that it breaks my heart that this is still happening to the world and this is still happening to children and this is still, you know, people are still getting beat up for this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, walking into our own building, this guy was wasted and was like, faggots, you know, while we're walking into our building. I'm, and I mean, we were just like, you're a joke. But for a lot of other people, it doesn't, it does not feel like that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And do you feel like part of why you, you, you could handle it, like some of the blowback was, you know, the way you sort of grew up? Because you talked about like your family and how your family seemed to like not, you know, they, they seemed, some, I guess, supportive of you coming out as gender fluid and like... Um, I, was, like I was raised Mormon or LDS. Um, my parents, when I invited my mom to like my public Facebook page, <laughs> she actually said that, she said to the London Times, not even like to me, <laughs> to the London Times, that she would actually dislike it if she could, um, because she doesn't think that people should be messing with gender. Um, and my parents believe that homosexuality is wrong, and are super clear on that, and I'm now been with my girlfriend for more than four years. And at the same time, my parents believe that it is just as wrong for them to be judgmental or treat me any differently um, f because I have a lifestyle, as they see it, that I don't agree with. And as my girlfriend put it, you know, if I didn't tell her that my parents felt that way, she wouldn't even know because they are totally loving and warm and welcoming and amazing. So how do they have both? How do they, how do they well, have it's, both? I really, and that's also why when I'm fighting to say, you know what, like equal rights, everybody should be able to believe how they want, I really believe that. Yeah. I believe that my parents should be able to believe what they believe and that I should be able to believe what I believe too and that it should be safe for everybody because I got to grow up in a family where even when we don't, you know, agree with each other. And let me be real, I'm the oldest of six kids. It's not like we were always like safe and gentle with each other. <laughs> um, I was really mean older <laughs> were you really? sibling in a lot of ways. Um, not about gender, but just <laughs> being the oldest and biggest. Um, the way it works. <laughs> but um, I did, I lived in a, a really loving household. And so I, I expect love and acceptance and respect and I, ex I expect people to accept others whether or not they agree with them to be able to accept them as human beings and to have to treat them with with a common courtesy right what shifted because you mentioned sort of a year between sort of finding this out for yourself and then it becoming fairly public the london times and <clears throat> going to your parents and such did you have enough time, do you think, to sort of find yourself and you were kind of prepared because it became very public very quickly um, and it affected your career both in a positive and I didn't know way. I was, I didn't have a feeling of looking for myself. Um, I was just like, I want to work in menswear, so <laughs> I'm cutting my hair. Um, and then people started stay, saying stuff like, um, I don't know, people had all kinds of things to say. Um, you know, it was that... So I had always identified as bisexual, right? So I had long blonde hair, and I was bisexual, and they were like, oh, you're just experimenting, you're straight. And then I have short hair, and they were like, liar trying to get straight privilege. <laughs> like, you're gay. <laughs> and there was a lot that came at me from within the LGBT community about um, being very upset that I was married to my husband and living a life of straight privilege. And um, receiving the benefits that there that there are from that, because let's be honest, like if I was dating a woman at the time and I cut my hair, I don't think it would have been on the Today Show. A lesbian cut her hair, <laughs> weird. <Breaking laughs> no one news. would care. <laughs> um, so it's accurate that 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 media attention came with that, but it was also not this like beautiful thing. Like I said, my work slowed way down. Um, and there, it was also during that time that to be, to be honest, my, I came to learn about sexual fluidity and that my sexuality was actually changing on me and that I didn't experience attraction to men in the same way that I had experienced attraction to men for, for all of that time. And there were a lot of people who were like saying how I was cutting my hair 
to express my gayness or do you think your sexuality is changing now that you've cut your hair? Um, and stuff where I was just like, you do know that your sexuality and your hair are like not connected. <laughs> um, oh <my> God. <laughs> but because... That, that's science. <laughs> just wanna make, that's a fact. <laughs> Um, but because my sexuality was actually changing on me <laughs> after I cut my hair, uh, because turns out sexual fluidity is a thing too that I didn't know about. Um, and it was a really hard time for me and my husband, you know, and I got to be with an incredibly loving man who I could be honest with all along. And I mean, I thought I was going through early menopause. Like I didn't know what was happening. Um, and so, I mean, I... <coughs> I don't know, I didn't feel like I lost myself or I was finding myself or whatever, but like, you know, life was changing on me and I was not ready for it to be public the way that it was. I had no idea that was coming. Um, but at the same time, I've always been someone who wants to make a difference in the world and wants to inspire people and to, to bring positive transformation. And, and so when people do come down on me, and I do... <coughs> Some people are nasty. Like, I'm not trying to say that, like, when everybody comes at me that I'm like, oh, please, educate me. <laughs> um, but yeah. even when people are nasty, maybe they're saying something that I do need to educate myself on. And so I will, so I'm going to take a fair look at that. Right. And I think it's just knowing the difference, right? Knowing the difference when you have to hold the line and decide, I'm not going to be told about this. I'm not interested in your, your thoughts about it. And when there's a teachable moment and something that you should be, you can learn from it. You know, there's, there's a difference. Yeah, I mean, when I did the MasterCard commercial um, about acceptance, there were a number of people that I grew up with. Um, I say grew up with. I mean, I went to 11 different schools and moved all over the place. Uh, so I have a lot of Facebook friends um, <laughs> of people like I actually know um, or knew when I was nine. Um, who, so these people were sharing this, and they would tag me in it. And then so I would look at the people's comments underneath. And <laughs> this one guy was like, acceptance just means um, if you don't agree with me, then I hate you. You know, this person should do a better job explaining what the heck that even means. And literally in the video, I was saying what acceptance meant to me. So I don't think he had pushed play. I don't know. Um, but I was like, actually, acceptance doesn't mean what you said. Acceptance means, and I wrote down what I said in the video. And he was like, thank you so much for taking the time to say that because you're right, I do think that is what it should mean. You know, so it's, there's these really awesome moments that actually do happen where people kind of take a step back and look at it. Yeah. So I, I do, you know, and then there's other times too where people just want to be mean. Right. Um, but I do try to, to see when I feel like someone, you know, could be open to something. Yeah. And, you know, Rain Dove, I don't know if any of you guys know Rain Dove, uh, their Instagram is Rain Dove Model. Um, it is unreal, the crazy, mean, yeah. evil stuff that people say to them. Yeah. And yeah. they take the time to be so yeah. I mean, accepting and loving yeah, to so everyone. True. It blows my mind. It's beautiful. I know. It's amazing. I know. It takes a special and they have, kind of And they have really changed people's minds in incredible, incredible ways. Yeah. So it's possible. It takes a special kind of human to be that way, right? Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes you get, you get tired of the crap and you're just like, I don't want to hear this anymore, right? And, but to take the time to, to teach like that, it takes a pretty special person. Yeah. So, and I don't think you should not count yourself amongst that. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, mm -hmm. you, you did the same thing. So, kudos to you. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. All right, so um, I think um, I'm going to have one more question for you before maybe you want to do your Q&A. And I think the last thing I would ask you is like, um, for the people that are going to be listening to the podcast, for the people who are maybe, I don't know, struggling a little bit with identity and struggling with, like, you know, figuring out where they land in this landscape of identity, and, you know, that can mean identifying or calling yourself something or li being labeled as something or not accepting labels at all. What would you say to those people who are kind of struggling with that? Uh, to keep looking for people that, that inspire you and lift you up and to stop looking at the people that have you feel bad. Yeah. Um, and you know, for some people what that looks like is following a Victoria's Secret model is gonna make you feel bad about yourself. Yeah. And for other people, it's gonna inspire them to get themselves to the gym when they actually need to. So it's, I'm not sitting here saying what's good or bad for anyone. 
Um, but really seek out the people who, who have you feel safe because there's, there's a lot of, there's so much of, of this planet that is not safe for so many people, you know? And if the safe place is literally what you create on your Instagram by the people that you follow, um, then let yourself have that. I mean, there's literally, there's Instagram profiles out there that are like LGBT safe place or <laughs> whatever, you know? It's, there are people who want, want to have that be there. And also, I would say that you don't have to pick, you don't have to like figure out what your identity is or what your style is or what your, uh, like, yeah. I pick all the things, you know, <laughs> like, and I, I think that's totally an option. Yeah, it is. Um, and I get that for a lot of people, probably people, you know, even listening or, or who knows that they don't have an environment that's giving them that. Yeah. So I think it's important for those of us who are safe to remember that visibility matters. And also remember that there are a lot of people who aren't safe, so it's also not on us to put pressure on other people to make themselves visible. Well said. Well said. Thank yeah. you for that. That's awesome. I want to <clears throat> kind of also piggyback on that a little bit because you talk a lot about fluidity in terms of your own identity, but, I mean, nobody thinks that what we wore as an 8-year-old is what we're going to wear when you're a 40-year-old, right? Or, I mean, there, there's such oh, a fluidity in terms of... Some, some, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but there's this idea that we're constantly changing our style. And I, I guess my question is, is how does fashion then, <clears throat> since you work in the fashion industry, sort of connect to this fluidity that you, um, you know, that you sort of embrace, this idea that things can change and will change and constantly change? How does fashion connect to that? Or how yeah, do how, do you, how do you use fashion as a tool in that? Or how does fashion play a role in that sort of I mean, I'm in a space? really lucky place now where a lot of you know, people will come to me and, you know, and say, you know, when I did the Millie campaign, she came to me and was like, we want you to do the Millie campaign because we're doing the, you know, we're doing equality for all. And I've done other things too where, you know, they're asking me the whole time, do you feel comfortable, you know, wearing this? Is this something that you feel like expresses you? That, that is not most people's experience. You don't, you don't get to be asked like that. Mm -hmm. And, and I do stuff too where I don't, where I'm not asked like that. Although I do speak up if I'm like, this is not, I don't want to wear a crop top and have like my tummy hanging out. I'm not feeling it. Mm -hmm. um, I will say so. <laughs> uh, but if it's just like I don't like it because I don't dig like the like the cut out, cut out shoulder thing. I don't. It's no. <laughs> just a hard no. Like that's how I feel about it. But I know that a lot of people really love that and they can do that. If you want to dress me in that, I'll, that's that's the kind of thing where I'm like, okay, that's in now, so it's my job to wear it as right. a model. Right. I'm, that's not the kind of thing where I'm going to be like, I don't feel comfortable wearing this. <laughs> but I have my personal opinion about it. Right. Um, so... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really hope there's like not someone wearing that. That's the that, takeaway. Like, right no now. cut off shoulders. <laughs> that's, that's the takeaway. Um... I can't see the flights are really bright. I'm really sorry if someone's wearing that or designs that. Um, not sorry for my opinion, but if I heard your feelings. Um, so <laughs> remind me what the question is. Just, just how fashion now kind of plays a role in your ability to be fluid or in your identity. Uh, I mean, the fashion industry is way more accepting than it ever has been of all of this and it's and for me personally okay yes what I'm wearing right now is odd but um it's also like traditional things put together in an untraditional way I'm not the kind of person who is going to want to wear like a chain mail dress or something that's just like really super out there or like a bunch of um I don't know fluorescent polka dots or something um, and there's totally people who want to wear that. Um, so for me, it's like, I actually look at what a lot of like traditional things are and how I could put them together. Or one day I want to wear something that's really traditionally masculine, traditionally feminine. And I, so for me, I enjoy that. I don't tend to choose things that are really like far out there. Yeah. Um, 
But the fashion industry is like really into that right now. So I feel like there's actually less current stuff <laughs> that I'm wearing. Right. Um, but it's also empowering a lot of people that it exists. So that's cool. Before we open it up to questions, I do. you did start a brand. So I wanted to, to hit on that real quick. Um, you want to tell them a little bit about what that brand is and why you started it? Yeah. So my girlfriend and I have a brand, and it's called Tom is Not a Boy. Um, because as I was kind of talking about earlier, there's this weird thing that a lot of masculine of center lesbians do in calling like, it's like you're a tomboy or a femme. <laughs> um, and we were like, or not. So Tom is not a boy. Um, and that's just kind of the cute name that we came up with. And it's cool to be a tomboy or a femme or whatever your thing is that you want to call yourself to, um, if that's empowering for you. I think that language should exist in order to empower, in order to create community, in order to create um, a go-to place that will have you feel safe, like I was talking about earlier. Yep. Um, and I think that oftentimes uh, the, the brands that are out there can do a lot to um, empower that. And so we want to really empower people in um, not feeling like they have to, to pick a box. Right, and again, I call it a brand and not like a fashion line because it's like t-shirts and hoodies and beanies and stuff like that. And I think that a lot of times people call themselves a fashion designer and when they like put logos on t-shirts and that's silly. Um, so I am not a fashion designer. <laughs> I do not do fashion. I own a brand um, that makes stuff that's actually super cool. And my girlfriend is an artist, so she actually does take some pieces that she does incredible work with. Um, I just think of things that were like the front of the t-shirt says, no, I'm not coming, and the back says, yes, you still have to invite me. <laughs> like, not a fashion designer. <laughs> just uh, enjoy so wearing <laughs> funny and fun stuff. There are so many companies out there that call them fashion design and do exactly that, right? <laughs> Yeah, and it's, I mean, I, and I love fashion. I love when people do fashion. And I also think it's really cool when people create messages that, you know, that, that's not an inspiring message. I'm not trying to pretend like it is uh, what I just said. But other ones that we do create that say, like, boys don't need to be boys, right? Because people are like, oh, boys will be boys. We're like, nah, boys don't need to be boys. And so that's one of our t-shirts. Mm -hmm. You know, we have another one that's like, can I swear? Yeah, please. So but the podcast is 100%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have one that says, like, what the fuck is lady like? Because really, you know? Um, so we have ones also that, that, are, that exist in order to make a difference. And 10% of all of our profits always go back to nonprofits that are making a difference for the planet, that are making a difference for people. Um, that, so we're making sure that always 10% of our profits are going to make a difference in the world. And... So far, everything that we've made has just been put back into the company anyway. So we're, we that's haven't actually, works. we're not actually making money yet, but <laughs> it's cool. That's awesome. So all, for all your fun gifts, you know, go to thomasnotaboy.com, right? Yeah. For the holiday. Um, did you like how I got that in there for you? Yeah. I um, appreciate we'll that. Plug. We also have like mugs and <laughs> bags and other fun stuff too. Pajamas. <laughs> oh no, pajamas. we need to do pajamas. There you get go. In that. Yeah. And you, you can give, them, that give it to your parents. You gotta get in that business. I love pajamas. <laughs> I was actually, I was at this dinner party, like this really fancy <laughs> dinner party with a big magazine, and this big editor came up to me. I was wearing this like white cotton pants and button up short sleeve shirt that had tropical floral flowers on it, and it looked pretty cool. And he was like, oh my gosh, I love your outfit. I, I wish I could have that. And I was like, well, it's Gap pajamas, so you can. <laughs> <laughs> True story. That was what I was wearing. And he was like, well, this is Gucci. <laughs> that was his response. And I just looked back at him and I was like, I know. <laughs> I love that. Awesome. So anyway, pajamas. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> you know I love it. On that note, let's open it up. We should all be in our pajamas. I think that would be great. The uh, microphone is just in the back, so if, um, and if we can bring up the lights a little bit so we can see. Who has a first question? Not all at once, kids. Not all at once. We're that quiet today. Wow, really? 
It doesn't have to be about like gender. Or <laughs> it could be literally like anything. And if I'm offended, I'll just say no. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, so my question was involving like protecting your personal versus brand. I know that it's been covered a lot versus this discussion, but when you were speaking about your upbringing and about your brand, I noticed a kind of a connection in like that cognitive dissonance between somebody supporting you, but also maybe not uh, understanding, but accepting. And I'm wondering if personally, as you're kind of going through the juxtaposition between a public life and a private life, how you self-protect on days, those days where you don't feel you want to be seen since you're out there so much. Really good question. Um, and I never say, good question. It's one of those Thank things you. I think is silly that people say. Um, but good question. I don't know. I, uh, I, I am a very private person. I'm someone who hangs out by myself a lot. Um, so maybe that's part of it, is just really making sure that I have my time for me. Um, and also, I don't, um, I feel like if I'm focusing on taking care of myself and that's what I'm thinking about, then I'm taking up a lot of space and time in my life thinking about me as opposed to actually thinking about other people. So if I'm like, okay, I want to go and I want to have a cup of coffee and I don't really feel like being social, at the same time, what I'm going to do is when I'm there, I'm going to say something friendly to the barista and I'm going to kind of like chat some people up and like be nice because I feel better when I've just been nice. Whereas if I'm sitting there like, I just want to be alone and I don't want to talk to people and I really want to have my alone time and that's super important to me right now that I have that, then I'm actually really stressed and I'm really self-consumed and I everything occurs to me as dangerous and invading that space that I wish that I had. Whereas if I come in as a loving person that's bringing joy and goodness, then I think people are actually more likely to leave me alone because they're not like, whoa, what is going on over there? Um, but I also just stay home a lot too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, how you doing? Um, I just wanted to touch base on, you, you pointed out how sometimes there's a lot, of, a lot of intolerance within the gay community, mm -hmm. and I was just curious, because you kind of straddle both sides, right? I, I knew that in the 80s and 90s, I think that a lot of more traditionally feminine women actually got a, a little discriminated against by the gay community, and now, you know, I think that you know, all the way through, I also think that masculine of center also, but I, I also find that we're just separated in so many ways. Yep. Um, I cut my hair recently, but not for any statement other than I was just really old and tired. <laughs> and I just wanted, like, just to be able to get up, just get to work, be done with it. And I find that, you know, we're looked at, I'm looked at differently and, you know, talked to at bars differently. And I'm just curious how you think, having seen both sides and probably also seeing the positives and the negatives, like you pointed out, how we can actually take that away in our own community. Um, so the community, like the LGBTQIA LGBTQ. yes. community. Um, so I agree with you that I think that there's a tremendous amount of division that um, when people put the divisions on you, anyone, I think it's dangerous. When people choose them for themselves, I think it can be empowering. Um, because I was, as I was saying before, that when so for me, discovering that there's a word called gender fluid, and I'm like, oh, that's me. I don't, it doesn't really make a huge difference to me personally to have a word. Um, but when I will speak out about my word, then gender fluid word, um, then other people are like, oh my gosh, that's me too. And then it allows them to feel understood and like they're not the only one and that they are um, acceptable. And when we put that on other people, whatever it is, then things can get ugly. 
And when I first cut my hair, there were um, so many people that did not know me and I had never met that were like, oh my gosh, I can see in your pictures now that like you really are your true self and that you weren't before in your old pictures. And um, all kinds of things that they had an opinion about that. And then when I started growing my hair, so it was like buzzed on both sides and really short in the middle. And then it was just all buzzed on the left side and kind of got longer on the other. And so there was like a very short or buzzed part for years. And then I started growing it and I went down like 10,000 followers because most of my followers were like, you sold out and you're not true to yourself because you said you were masculine and you said you were a dyke and you said you were, I don't know, whatever the other mass, butch. Um, I never said any of those things. You like that. you guys reposted my photo and put those hashtags underneath <laughs> it. And um, it kind of blew my mind yeah. like how many people got upset about my hair growing um, and like took it really personally. And it's just like <laughs> as much as I want to sit here and mock them, um, <laughs> I also realized that for some people, it's because they feel that someone who represented them positively in the media abandoned them. And so again, it's one of those things where I'm kind of like, okay, I can look at this and when I look at it as an education opportunity, what that means to me in this case is that I'm gonna take this opportunity to educate other people about not doing that. Um, because it's so nasty and it's ugly. Like, I'm fine that I went down 10,000 followers. Like, I'm okay. But people will, like, get, like, aggressive and mean and angry about it. And if you're doing that to somebody else who, again, is, like, 17 or something because they decide to grow their hair, are you kidding me? Um, and as far as real-life treatment, not, like, cyber treatment, yeah, it's way different in terms of like who talks to you and who decides what's okay. And so it's like, you know, I experienced the, it not being cool once I cut my hair. I experienced it not being cool now that I look more feminine. Um, I get people who get upset when I wear lipstick. I get people who get upset when I wear heels. Um, I, get, I get it all, you know, and it's all silliness. And again, like I'm just, I'm so freaking lucky that I've always had like partners and family that are just awesome. Um, so I've, I've always had my safe places. I'm really, really lucky, but it's also because I do not put up with people who are not making it safe. I have been with people who have made racist comments, for example, that have nothing to do with me, but I hear that and I'm like, I can't be with somebody like you. So if you aren't going to like you know, be willing to t take a step back and look at yourself and the way that you're seeing the world right now and what you think is acceptable. And just because there are other things that look worse, mm -hmm. like, no, like you need to stop and you need to look at that because you, even if I, you're white and I'm white and you're saying nasty things that have nothing to do with me, I still consider that has everything to do with me because you're making the world less safe. And so when I make sure that the people around me are safe people, then I get to do more for the planet because that's what takes care of me. That actually goes back to the other question that you're asking before too. Yeah, that's great. There's there's such a tension between visibility and invisibility with fashion because fashion can identify you or through an appearance very quickly to a group like you said. It's kind of like a label, but sort of one that speaks for you. And then on the other hand, that that can be very narrowing yes. when a haircut all of a sudden becomes your sexuality, right? <laughs> right? Or connected to yeah. your sexuality. I'm curious. Um, if you, th in terms of the fashion industry as a whole, because we have a lot of designers here and, 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 and students who want to work in the industry, are there any sort of shining examples, you think, of brands that are doing an authentic job of reaching out to the LGBT community or thinking about gender fluid, um, fluidity in a different way? I and mean, we had Rob Smith here with the Fluid Project, but um, I'm just curious if there's certain examples, um, positive examples, of companies that are making a difference or at least trying. Um, Gucci, for one, as I mentioned before, I think is doing a really great job. Um, oh my gosh, like any other time I feel like I could think of a million, now I'm just sitting here like, mm. uh, Vivian Westwood, um, Rick Owens, 
um, in, a, in a really different way. Brooklyn Woods is not as great, I think, about being race inclusive, but I do think that it is moving in a better direction. Um, Millie is, does a really great job of being uh, race inclusive, but I think can do more in terms of sizing. Um, Chromat does an incredible job of being like super, super inclusive. I mean, they literally had one white model, I think, in their last show, and it was M, you know, like the very first plus size model. Um, and she was like the only white chick in the whole thing. Um, and like half the girls were trans and, um, but it's all pretty much like swimwear and body con stuff. So if that's not your thing, then they don't, they have t-shirts. Um, who else? I don't know. I'm having a hard time. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, let me ask you sort of a piggyback question on that is, um, Celine Dion just launched her sort of gender fluid uh, line for kids. I did not know that. No, you didn't? No. She just launched it. It was a very big I deal. It hit CNN, New York Times. But yeah. then, um, as of the last two weeks, I've seen more hate articles about how she's summoning the devil and Satan himself through children. And I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah. No, seriously, this yeah, is a real thing. That's it was a in, good reaction. Yeah. That's exactly the reaction you should have. <laughs> what which, is wrong with you? Which reminded we have a long way to go still. Uh, but that's the kind of thing where, I mean, like, my parents definitely would not think there's any Satan summoning happening. <laughs> but um, they could also not agree with it, but they're not going to say stuff like that. Like, that is what I mean. And honestly, like, when we on the other side, you know, say crazy, nasty stuff about them... Right? Like if, if we sat here and like, they're all psychopaths and they should die, right? Then we're just as bad. Yeah, right. So I, I honestly think we all need to be really mindful. Yeah. You know, it's, I didn't know about all that though. Yeah. That's whoa. It's playing itself out right now. Other questions? Down here. If somebody could br um, get the mic. To hand her my microphone. <laughs> I, I was going to do the same. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I mean, it's not really a question. I'm sort of formulating thoughts about like paralleling your your words with um, besides what I, I also really, really hate shoulder cutouts. I also hate <laughs> dressing appropriately for your age, whatever Word. the fuck that's yeah. supposed to mean. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I guess maybe just some thoughts about um, the health of the future of, of people's um, notions around dressing as you grow older? Uh, so like age stuff, ageism. Um, I, so I am 36 and- You're so old. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, in a world where there's 14 year olds walking on the runway, yeah. I am great grandma. <laughs> um, for real, <laughs> you know? Are you the one that's sitting next to them on Instagram going, hey, what's up? What are you looking at? I, I <laughs> did a diesel show in Venice. There were 81 models. It was a really big show. And still, some of the, the kids I did that with, I was 31 at the time, still call, they were British. They still call me mummy. Um, <laughs> true story. Wow. Um, I totally was, though. Like, one of the boys was doing cocaine in the room, and I was like, what is wrong with you? Do your parents have any idea about that you do this? <laughs> so I, I do that. Um, but... Back to your question. Um, in terms of what's happening with age, I think that we are seeing more older models than we have in a really long time, which is really great. Um, I've been in this really interesting space, um, interesting for me, <laughs> um, where I clearly do not look 18 or like brands that are looking for early 20s, late teens, the kind of thing that's always been what people think of as a model. Um, but now that being older is cool, there's a lot of call for, I, I would personally put it at 45 and older. So now I'm in this in-between place where like every casting I go on now, they tell me that I look too young, um, which I'm like, that's really exciting if people keep asking for it. <laughs> so keep doing that, please, consumers. Um, So do I think that it's getting better? I think that it's getting a lot better. I think that people are taking w what we've called fashion risks um, by, I don't even want to call it a fashion risk because I think it's ridiculous. It's like, 
Where would you want, man? Um, yeah, I, I feel like there's a lot more acceptance than there has been for sure. I also think that magazines still including dress for your age kind of stuff is not necessarily helpful. Um, it is also accurate that there are certain things that I wore 10 or 15 years ago that I don't feel comfortable wearing now. Um, and I guess that's dressing for my age, but I don't think of it that way. It's literally, I don't feel comfortable. Like I don't, it doesn't feel the same way that it felt to me at one time. Um, and if it feels that way to somebody else that they feel rocking in it, then like rock on. Um, I think that we also need to be careful though about being like, wow, she's brave, you know, saying things like that because it's, we all now have reached a point that if we're calling her brave or courageous or whatever, like we all know that's an insult now, like we know. Um, and I mean, I remember when I first cut my hair and like the day that I was on the Today Show, I, and, and I was walking through Central Park, I got stopped like four times by women being like, you are so courageous for cutting your hair. I can't believe you didn't even ask your husband's permission. <laughs> and stuff where it was just, what? In New York? <laughs> it, crazy, New York City. crazy. Um, so did that offend me? No, but it's also when we just like let people say stuff, then we let things continue to exist. So, um, I keep bringing it back to race, which is like not related, but I'm gonna use this example anyway. Um, I was on a photo shoot and there was this woman talking about how her, she was saying that her children are colorblind and that they actually like don't see color. And I just said, I think that if that's entirely accurate, that it's really unfortunate she was white. And I said, because then your children can't see certain advantages they have that maybe their friends don't have. And she immediately was like, Yes, totally. And my kids didn't say that. I just said that about them. <laughs> um, she like wanted to defend them immediately, which I thought was super cute. Um, but the point is, I mean, I grew up. I I grew up not seeing color. Like I did not. I grew up in a Mexican neighborhood in Arizona um, when I was little, and it wasn't until I lived in neighborhoods, white neighborhoods, later that I was like, this is weird. Um, <laughs> What's this all about? That you know that I saw that it was different and but it had me not see my privilege for a really, really, really long time. Right. And it had me not get um, the advantages that I had in life. And so it's this weird thing in general where it's like we want to help people not say things regarding ageism or taking risks or being courageous uh, because we're perpetuating something. So figuring out that line between like saying something and not saying something also because you don't want to make everything a big deal and everything bigger than it is when it's not. Uh, so it's tricky. It's, I think it is really tricky to figure out how to navigate a lot of that. And there's not like this answer of like anything. Um, but I think that it, I do think that it's getting better. And I think that as we continue calling for um, models that actually represent the demographic <laughs> um, that they're geared towards, it makes a big difference. I have to ask this because it's kind of circling around a little bit, but do you think that in some ways kind of queering fashion or at least this more visibility is having an effect on the Me Too sort of issues around, especially around the male photographers and, and so on? There, you know, Clearly, there's been a lot that's come out in the last three years that isn't a surprise to a lot of people, but I'm just curious if you think these are the kinds of conversations that sort of underlie these power differences, these... Um, issues, whether you're female, male, or fluid, or wh wherever you, you identify, if, if the, having these conversations is having a difference in fashion? I think it's having a huge difference. I think there's also a lot of people who, um, you know, who are still making fun of it. There's a lot of people who, oh, back in my day, we could just say that, and it was fine. Um, you hear people saying stuff like that, and it's, and, and I will be honest, and there was a lot of, um, if you, if there wasn't sexual banter on set, um, like something was wrong and you definitely weren't gonna be like working again. Um, and not, literally not in a way where anyone was unsafe or any that I was aware of, or certainly not that I felt, un there are times where I was way unsafe and people were way inappropriate and it was terrible. And there were times where I was participating in sexual banter and everything seemed safe and fine and 
But for all I know, like the the makeup artist was hating it the whole time or something, and, and I don't know. Um, because there was this this demand for everything to feel sexy all the time, all the time. You know, even if you were wearing uh, mom jeans or, you know, and you're working for like Belks or something, you know, we'd still all be making jokes the entire time. Um, that all came back to sex. That that stuff is not happening now. Um, and it's not just because I'm old and nobody thinks I'm sexy anymore because <laughs> um, the young folks are still around. Um, and it's, it's, it is getting better and we're not hearing it as much and people are checking themselves. And also because a lot of people are speaking up in their social media about things right after they happen mm -hmm. too, that, that that wasn't there before. It's, I'm not trying to get anybody to stay on their phones all the time or be a blogger or whatever, but I do think that using our social media to, to, for empowerment of ourselves and others is something that's actually a really beautiful thing that make, does make a difference in the world. Okay, so I think we're gonna wrap it up. I have one last question for you. It's like a bit of a takeaway question. Um, and you know, I think we have a bunch of, uh, in this, we have FIT, so I'm guessing we have a bunch of uh, budding fashion designers here. And I'm curious, what do you think that they, that you want to leave them with today when they think about um, making sure that they are designing and thinking about the queer community? What would you like to leave them with? Like, what do you think is a good takeaway for them to think about in terms of the queer community? Like, they, I'm not saying that they're all designing for them, but like, for the ones that might be, what, what, did, what should they think about? Um, I think how you choose your language when describing whatever the clothes are that you're making. So if it has um, frills, do you have to call them feminine frills? You know, um, if it has boxy shoulders, do you have to call that a masculine shoulder? Um, there are certain things that, that we do that, um, like I was saying, being mindful of, of what it is that we're perpetuating in the world. If we say that something makes you look young, do we need to say that? Is that what we really want to be, be saying? That it, you know, that it's slimming. Um, that, and maybe that is what you want to do. Maybe that is totally your intention and what you want to create in the world and how you want it to live. Um, but maybe you want more people to feel comfortable wearing your clothes and maybe you don't want to label it so much. Uh, even if you're calling it menswear and women's wear, maybe not using those same uh, descriptors. Mm -hmm. um, or just being mindful if you do, mm -hmm. that it's really done in a, in a mindful way. And then whoever it is that you choose to show in your clothing in the, ultimately in the advertising or lookbooks or on your website or whatever it is, that uh, queer doesn't just mean people with like green hair and a bunch of piercings. Um, a lot of people seem to think that like, if I'm including the LGBT community, then I need to get people who just look really weird. Um, and you're totally gonna get people in the LGBT community who are gonna say that that is what you need to do so that they look queer. Um, so not everybody feels the same way I do. Right. But um, I think ultimately it's, it's more important that you're showing inclusivity of race, that you're showing inclusivity of size, that um, inclusivity of ability, and that it's fun, you know, when someone you're like, are they male, are they female? I don't know, like that's fun, but I honestly don't think it's like a thing that's super important. Just to be totally honest. <laughs> Well, and I know you called out, um, not called out, but asked a brand to stop calling it. Was it the boyfriend sweater, the boyfriend jean? Or oh, boyfriend jeans. Yeah. yeah. And that like Gap now has like your favorite girlfriend jeans. Um, so, you know, when we say stuff, it's, it makes a difference. And people, people actually do check themselves and they, they think about it. And, you know, so once we say something, then, then it has, it at least puts it in people's mind. I want to thank both of you for coming today. It was such a pleasure to have both of you and your perspectives. I think it's one that at least I'm seeing a lot in the industry. Um, 
you know, whether you're queer or not queer, whatever you are, I think the conversation about inclusivity and thinking differently how we talk about clothing and how we use clothing both, I think, as a weapon, but also as, as a form of empowerment is, is, is a conversation worth having. So thank you, Elliot. Thank you, thank Corinne, you. for coming. Um, thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you next week for our last lecture with the Fashion Service Network. We'll see you guys next week.